Wendell and Wild. After almost 14 years since the release of Coraline, stop motion icon Henry Selleck is back with another animated feature to deliver some good old genuine cartoon spookiness, which is very rare to find nowadays, especially in mainstream animation. The announcement of his return kind of made me wonder where did he go after all these years? Yeah, I know some of that time was making this picture, but still, over 13 years is quite a big gap to have no extra film credits somewhere. Well, not long after Coraline, Selick was originally going to do something awesome, which was creating Pixar's first stop motion feature called The Shadow King. That would have been amazing to see them explore other animation mediums with their masterclass storytelling. Why didn't this get made? Well, long story short, John Lasseter doesn't want people to have nice things if they would steal his thunder. So he ruined the whole project with never-ending demands and changes. I just couldn't handle the battle. I felt like, you say you love Coraline, you say you love this original idea. But anyway, after that, I was uh, in a fallow period for quite a while. But then came Keegan-Michael Key and Jordan Peele who decided to team up with Henry Selick to give him another chance by turning the story from an unpublished book by Selick and Clay McLea Chapman into his next movie. And who knew that Peel specifically turned out to be a great partner for the animator, since he became an acclaimed filmmaker thanks to Get Out and is a major stop motion fan who really wanted this movie to happen. So much so that it's why Jordan Peele's name is also alongside Henry's as the writer and producer. So now that Cat unleashed her demons, will this movie bring stop motion glory back from the dead? Or will this review just be me performing an exorcism on this film? Let's find out. The Story When the demons make their way to the land of the living, that's when all hell breaks loose and the town of Rustbank is engulfed in chaos. The source of all this madness comes from a 13-year-old girl named Kat, whose story is that she wants to break the cycle of her troubled life after her parents died in an accident by bringing them back from the dead. And she gets the help of two demon brothers to accomplish the task. But hold on, there's more. The demons, Wendell and Wilde, want to escape their life doing chores for their gigantic dad and create their own amusement park, but have to work with a priest named Father Bess in order to get the money. But then there's Father Bess' side of the story where he also needs the money to keep the school he's running afloat and the only people he can rely on are the greedy Claxons who desperately want to turn the whole town into a prison. And at the school, there's a nun named Sister Helly who knows that Kat has newfound demon powers and wants to help solve her problems. So, what do you believe just happened? You see, when I said that the demons make all hell break loose, I don't just mean for Kat and the town. As you probably noticed, the movie's biggest problem is that the story is completely all over the place. And what I've mentioned isn't even all of them. It has all these side plots that it constantly juggles around that it makes it difficult to follow or fully grasp what is happening in the big picture. I'll give it that it does try to make every moment and most characters significant, each playing a role in the narrative to keep moving the film forward and not have a scene feel like unnecessary filler. The intentions are well, but with the large quantity of plots hopping all over each other, it causes the storytelling to feel a bit disorienting. The best way to describe it is that the story is like a feature-length conspiracy board. Yes, the plot lines all connect to one another, and it all does make sense when you inspect it carefully, but it doesn't change that it's all over the place and it feels disjointed as if it was crafted by a madman who doesn't know how to put his mind in order. Guess we got what we deserve. We? You have not begun to get what you deserve. Now, before anyone accuses me of being a cynical grump because of my comments, keep in mind that throughout my criticism, never once did I say that I did not enjoy it. The one thing that makes up for its problems in terms of the storytelling is that the execution makes all of this as enjoyable as it can be. This may be chaotic, 
but I had a lot of fun throughout my experience, as it always delivers these crazy ideas for the world building and character development that continuously keeps my attention and get engaged with the events to see how the demon's necromantic powers can infect the living around them. On top of its unique concept of how life and death works and what roles do demons have with your soul. Not to mention how the tone contains a great balance of Halloween style macabre and humor to have this be all around pleasant. You have the light horror side to emphasize the spooky supernatural theme of demons and the undead, but none of it is too scary to make the viewing frightening. And there's also the comedy that is mostly controlled by Key and Peele's legendary dynamic, resulting in a great combination where it's not afraid to get freaky to give that element of surprise, but this is all for fun for the sake of giving its viewers a smile throughout. Listen, as your older brother, I demand you regret to take that cream now. Why would I do that, Wendell? Fresh cream ain't gonna revivify a bad plug. Did you just admit you've been stealing the cream? Uh-huh. Why? Because it tickles my tummy. Much like Kat's new demon-like abilities, the story can get chaotic to the point of being all over the place, but I can't deny that it was a crazy ride and I enjoyed every minute of it. The Animation Stop motion has often been the home of some uniquely strange designs, the kind that have their own unusual charm where we see them as living dolls coming to life. In the case of Wendell and Wilde, however, the designs really push the weirdness to the next level with how it fully embraces the abstract style. This is because the team hired Argentinian illustrator and caricaturist Pablo Lobato to be the feature's lead designer as his signature use of shapes, lines, and patterns surprisingly translate well with this kind of 3D environment. Usually, his artwork is meant to be completely flat images, but now with the added dimension used for stop motion, it delivers a unique look to the picture that can easily make it stand out among the crowd, but still work in the context of the film with how unnatural things can get. Kind of like the characters look like how the situation can be, if you get what I mean. I also like how the caricature element is still there with how Wendell and Wilde is just cartoon demon versions of Key and Peel. They're massively stylized, but you can still tell that it's them. You, well, you still got 800 tasks to complete. That is right. So, as your masters, we order you to turn around and, uh... <sighs> Also, an interesting thing to point out with the designs is that it's so abstract that it's able to get away with keeping the lines on their faces. Normally, they had to be edited out so that you don't see the separation between the interchangeable mouths and expressions. In this case, however, the style is so disconnected from realism and often uses lines and sharp corners to create the characters that it actually doesn't look out of place on them. When it comes to the backgrounds, though, that helps set the mood to show the dilapidated state of Rust Bank, as if the whole town was ruined as much as Kat's life after the accident with muted and mostly grey colors, along with mostly abandoned architecture filling the scene to show its near hopeless state. But it doesn't avoid building some crazy places to stand out more like Belzer's fairground that's on his stomach. As for the character animation, which goes in a different route than the designs, the way they move still remains anatomically correct, but it's true that they are a bit more expressive than normal in order to really show how they come to life. Oh, speaking of which, there's also some very playful moments for the animators too, where they get to be creative with the zombie characters and the demons. When it's time for the movie to get spooky, the team delivers with some impressive effects and make the most with what these characters can do. Hey! But what could be the visual highlights of the feature is when we step out of reality and get into the dreams and flashbacks, where they break their own rules to go even more surreal than before and go into different styles to show the events of the past and the future, like some 2D scenes and moments where they emulate shadow puppetry. At 
least in terms of the mainstream ones, this is one of the weirdest looking animated films out there. However, I say that as a compliment because weird is what makes the animation here twistedly beautiful. The characters. With all the different narratives happening at once, this is one of those movies that has a lot of characters among the cast. By the way, just a heads up that there's going to be a lot to talk about here, so this part of the review will be longer than usual. Like I said, it does try to make each of them as developed as they can be or help contribute to the story, but it shows that some of them had to cut corners in order to fit in themselves in the film and ultimately feel a little generic and sometimes forgettable. Then again, I will give it credit that regardless of the role, the film does have great overall voice actors that provide some performances that really help strengthen some characters to make them more fun and easier to connect with. Of course, the more recognizable names like Keegan-Michael Key, Jordan Peele, Angela Bassett, and James Hahn show off their acting skills very well here, but there's also Lyric Ross as Kat and Sam Zalea as Raul who did a great job too, especially with the challenging task to get into their emotional side and make what they say sound personal. What sort of girls go here? Prize poodles. All best in show. Whoa! It's Taz Cyclops. Some other stuff, too. Let's start off with the hell maiden herself, Cat, whom I could say is the best character of the picture. While she may first seem like the typical rebellious girl who doesn't follow the rules, she's actually a tragic figure whom her biggest enemy is not the demons or greedy people, but her past. She blames herself for the death of her parents and then had to go through a tough life where she has to fight for herself even if it means to frequently get in trouble for it. However, that tough exterior is just to compensate how vulnerable she is on the inside, and how she's been a survivor who went through some horribly traumatic moments at such a young age. She's got nothing to lose, so that's why she's fine to make a deal with some demons in order to have what she wants the most, and that's to have her parents back. Whom their caring nature is one of the rare examples for Kat that there is still some good in this world. What is possibly the best thing about her and what she contributes to the picture is that she adds an emotional message regarding not to let your past control you. Among everything that happened, the hardest thing she tries to do is forgive herself. To let go of her regrets so that she could focus on making the future better for both herself and everyone around her. In this age of mental health awareness, it's honestly a real good moral that everyone should be reminded of. Cat. Stupid enough to get my parents killed? Stupid enough to just watch them drown, not even try to help? Stupid enough to believe they could ever stop? It couldn't have all been your fault, Cat. Then you have the title demons themselves, Wendell and Wild. In a way, some could say that they are more the typical key and peel comedic roles similar to Bunny and Ducky from Toy Story 4. Technically true, but that's not a bad thing here. They provide great comedy to give the feature some well-needed laughs, and they are interesting characters themselves that supply their own lore about what demons are and their powers. Plus, their story does have some appeal where they share some of Kat's qualities with the need to break the status quo, ditching their days of growing their father's hair and create a better amusement park than the one on their dad's stomach. Jeez. Can, can you believe that being glorious blowhard? I just love him, can't leave him. Dang souls have to praise him. At our fair, folks will be lined up wanting to get in. Indeed. Another character that grabbed my attention was Sister Helly. With how she has this great interest in Kat and for her safety, there's like this mystery surrounding her that kept me curious to know who she could really be especially when they present her as much more than just the typical nun and knows a lot more about what Kat's going through than she debatably should. I'd also add Raul as another fascinating one because he's a guy who just never fits in. There was a time when he tried to be like all the other schoolgirls, but it never felt right for him, which was why he sacrificed school popularity to become what he really wanted to be, an artist, along with transitioning to his true gender. His outcast role makes him a suitable ally for Kat, 
giving her someone to connect with, and a key to start opening her heart to think more than just herself and her woes. I... I tried to be, but... You're not nearly as annoying. And then there are those who have more antagonistic roles. Because there's so many of them, including those who make themselves seem like a possible obstacle, the movie doesn't have time to fully develop an actual villain that could be as impactful as the protagonist. There are the schoolgirls who try and fail to assimilate Kat to be one of their own, but then one of them turns good after hearing what the real villain's big plans are. There's Buffalo Belzer, who's like the big devil of the feature, and well, fine as is, he could have benefited to have more screen time to further develop the relationship with Wendell and Wilde. Father Bess could have been a solid villain as the headmaster of the school who is desperate to get whatever money he needs to keep the school alive. It wouldn't be until he died and was revived by Wendell and Wilde where his devotion to God gets thrown out the window and goes into blasphemy levels to get what he wants, even raising the dead to do his deeds. He has what it takes to be an imposing leading antagonist. But too bad his position got whacked with a golf club and was taken by the Klaxons, who are the generic capitalist bad guys that wants to turn the whole town into a prison for their own profit. They honestly feel like they came straight out of a Captain Planet episode with how their personalities are that they have zero moral standards and only care about making money. Especially when the guy looks like he's just an orange tan away from looking a little too familiar. <laughs> I am proud of you, dear. I wouldn't say that everyone was great here, and the movie did bite off more than it could chew with its cast, but for the ones that they got right, they did very well to contribute a lot of heart to the picture, and topping off with some great performances, there will at least be some characters that will be responsible for giving you an awesome time, rather they be angels or demons. It's been a long time since we've had a good old-fashioned horror-themed stop-motion film, and this is a very welcoming new addition. Wendell and Wild is a chaotically fun animated feature that provides a good dose of spookiness and comedy. The story may be a little too cluttered and can go all over the place to the point of being difficult to follow, along with some not-so-great villains, but the unique abstract visual designs, the great stop motion animation, the strong message of letting go of your past, the enjoyable voice acting, Key and Peele's dynamic comedy, and some greatly crafted characters all combine to turn this into a wild ride filled with plenty of surprises that will be sure to give you a highly enjoyable time from beginning to end. This is one of those films that I can easily see this as a new Halloween classic like The Nightmare Before Christmas, Corpse Bride, and Paranorman to really get people in that holiday spirit. So I recommend you add that to your Halloween watch list, and even say that it's worth checking out if ever you're in that spooky feeling and want a taste of some cartoon horror. And if you want more of that taste of this review, then subscribe to my channel and you'll get to have all kinds of animated flavors through my videos. Welcome back, Mr. Selleck. I and many others are very happy to see you return with that stop motion magic, even if they come from a couple of scheming demons. Hey, Sparkplug!